um, Tech Insider Update. Appreciate you all joining today. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, it's going to be a, a good hour, uh, rapid fire as we go through a lot of the updates that we feel like you guys need to be aware of um, or brought across the Microsoft staff. Um, just a little bit of a, an intro about Journey Team. Um, about us, you know, we're over 100 members now, um, been in business 27 years. Um, over the past five years, we've done over 1,300 projects. Um, so we've, we've had a lot of experience and, and a lot of the do's and don'ts of, of what's, what, what you should be doing with the Microsoft staff. Um, we also are uh, a partner of the year winner. We've won both for in the, uh, in the Dynamics 365 customer engagement for media and communications, as well as for Business Central. We also were an Eagle Crystal Trophy Award winner, which means that we, uh, we you know, as one of the top uh, partners um, within the U.S. Um, and as we go through, as we talked about, we're going to be covering a lot of things about the different Microsoft stack um, and try to do what we can through this next hour of some of the important areas. But there are going to be things within the Microsoft stack that we do help and assist with, but we don't are going to be necessarily covered. So here's a kind of good list of, of some of the areas that we, we cover throughout the Microsoft um, stack. Enterprise resource planning, customer engagement, modern workplace, knowledge management, data and BI. And of course, we do a lot with change management and adoption as well to help you use those solutions. All right, so for our agenda today, we're going to start off and touch on some cloud and Office 365 items um, with Exchange Online, touch on some new updates with Azure, as well as Microsoft Unified Endpoint Management, which formerly was known as Intune. Um, touch on Microsoft Teams, um, the new Microsoft Viva SharePoint and cover forms and planner. And we're going to hit on Dynamic 365 customer engagement updates with marketing, sales, field service, geofencing, and customer service. Um, circle up on Power Apps, Power Virtual Agent, Power Automate, and then wrap up at the end with Dynamic 365 Business Central and Power BI. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn the time over to Eric Roth, and he'll uh, he'll take us from there. Um, actually, before I, I cut, turn it to Eric, we are going to be doing a survey at the end of this. Um, it should be posted in the chat right now, so you'll have it available to you. It's a short survey. Um, we'll be doing a drawing for a, a gift card at the end of this event. Um, so be sure to fill that out. We'll give you some time at the end as well. But with that, I'll go ahead and let Eric take it away. All right. Hello, hello. Glad to be here. So to start out with, these are some general Office 365 and cloud updates to be aware of. Um, basically, uh, if you're still using Internet Explorer 11 or older, um, Microsoft is working on finally closing that door down. August of this year, uh, you will not be able to use IE 11 or you'll have a degraded feature experience if you're on IE 11. So I've got another point in here about Edge um, that we'll talk about, but get off IE 11, all right? Um, TLS 1.0 and 1.1 are being disabled again in Microsoft 365. In short, um, they kind of pause this uh, locking down of these old um, security protocols. What this means is if you're using a, uh, a device, think old devices, Windows 7, um, that doesn't have the proper updates on it, you won't be able to access and interact with Office 365 services um, with that SSL, HTTPS, TLS um, negotiation protocol of 1.0 and 1.1. 1.2 is where you want to be. So um, just be aware that that is, that is again, uh, rolling out across the Office 365 services to remove support for those old protocols. Um, the point about Edge, the legacy version of Microsoft Edge. We're not talking the new cool Edge Chromium engine, right? We're talking the old Edge. Microsoft calls it their legacy version of Edge. That is going out of support in March of this year, coming up quite soon. Uh, another really important thing to be aware of is Microsoft is rolling the uninstallation of Legacy Edge and the installation of Edge into their uh, cumulative update of Windows 10. Uh, sometimes they call that update Tuesday updates, right? That's coming in April of this year, and it will rip off the old Legacy Edge browser and drop the new Chromium Edge version on that device. Um, my experience with Edge on the Chromium engine has been wonderful. I've, I've heard great reports about it and uh, highly recommend you looking at Edge as your 
uh, new browser to replace that IE use case. Okay, so a couple updates there. Another fun one here, this is always confusing to me. Um, the names of Azure AD roles are finally getting consolidated. Okay, so there's this little table here. Um, the CRM service administrator was how you would see that role in some interfaces. It, it was also named the Dynamics 365 administrator. It was really the same thing, but different places exposed the name of that role in, in different uh, uh, names. And so they're consolidating all this. So that far right-hand column is the official name that all the places of uh, Azure um, will expose the name of that role, okay? So that's good news. And if you were confused about is the CRM service administrator different than the Dynamics 365 administrator? It was just surprise, surprise, Microsoft's wonderful naming. And they finally got together and said, let's uh, get all this matched up. So that's something cool that's coming. Um, another cool thing, just a quick little note here. If you like the, um, um, well, hold on. I got this image ahead of my, my point. Uh, the first point is the Groove Sync Client. Um, hope, I haven't talked about the Groove Sync Client in quite a while, but it is now no longer going to be able to talk to Microsoft's cloud. SharePoint, OneDrive for Business, et cetera. This is good news. Um, the uh, Groove client is uh, junk compared to the OneDrive client is the short version of it. So I'm glad Microsoft's shutting this down. If you still have people using Groove, um, then it will break, but please get people off Groove as quickly as you can. How do you know if you're using the Groove client? Because it looks has a similar icon. If you right click on it and you don't see a settings option, it's the Groove client. Okay, if you right click on the OneDrive icon down in the system tray, you get settings. It's the new OneDrive.exe. It's not the old Groove.exe, which they're killing and, and deprecating. Okay, uh, another fun little thing there's dark mode in OneDrive for business. For all you dark mode lovers, uh, just go to your settings in the OneDrive interface and you've got a little slider there. I've got a screenshot for it that you can turn dark mode on. Kind of fun. Okay, next is the uh, universal print. Um, if you've never heard of what universal print is, then reach out to us. In short, it's a cloud-based printing solution from Microsoft that allows you to print to your computers without needing print servers or um, on-prem infrastructure. It's even compatible with legacy printers that don't support this standard universal print protocol. Um, there's a little gateway you can install on-prem that you can broker printing to your printers through. And that license to use universal print is yours free of charge. It's gonna get included in the existing Microsoft 365 bundles, um, specifically around the, uh, the bunch of bundles, Business Premium, F3, E3, E5, A3, 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 blah, 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 blah. So universal print, if you're interested in printing better um, with an out of the box solution for Microsoft, um, we can help you with that. So that's getting bundled with your license. All right, let's talk about a couple of Exchange Online updates. Um, Plus-based email address, uh, plus-based email addressing, uh, also sometimes called sub-addressing, is the reality. So, for example, you could send an email to Eric Roth plus my favorite vendor name that I signed up for something that I don't want them to spam me on. And if they do, I'll set up a rule to send their mail to somewhere else. Right? Um, that's in place now. You do have to enable it via PowerShell. There's the command right there. It's really simple. Um, and the other cool thing is it does work with existing addresses. You've technically been able to have a plus symbol in an email address, and Microsoft will first check for that email address. If it doesn't find it, it will then apply plus-based addressing logic, okay? Be aware, don't go turn this on if you have mail flow routing on-prem and you expect this to work because Exchange on-prem has no clue what plus-based email addressing is. So if you have mail flow routing to on-prem, come talk to us, we can help you get uh, natively uh, mail flow through the cloud. Um, another little update, this will only affect a few of you, but um, Microsoft is officially um, going to be implementing their published uh, message thresholds, uh, uh, performance thresholds for the amount of mail you can receive in a particular length of time. Uh, 3,600 messages per hour per mailbox. Um, that's kind of been a soft suggestion and they haven't enforced it and they will be actually working to get to that number on an enforcement standpoint. They'll reset every hour. You'll be notified if you're being throttled. So really just kind of a heads up. If you've got large amounts of email hitting a particular mailbox, be aware that this could be affecting you. Okay. 
All right, um, next is uh, the wonderful um, legacy protocol or uh, the basic auth concept of talking to exchange. So the uh, Microsoft has kind of changed this posture a little bit over the time. Um, they suspended the rollout of those uh, locking down legacy protocols um, during the pandemic. They're now picking that back up. I, maybe Microsoft thinks the pandemic's over. I don't know. I don't <laughs> think so, but hey, I like where we're going. Anyway, um, so they're not going to disable these protocols in your tenant if they're currently in use. They're telling you they'll give you a year's notice before they do that. If you have a brand new tenant today, these will be disabled. Um, and if you're not using these basic um, authentication legacy protocols, they will start turning them off for you. Okay. So um, there's a way to test. Um, these are the affected protocols. So if you recognize these old legacy beasts, POP, IMAP, MAPI, RPC, SMTP, offline address book, uh, Exchange Web Services, et cetera, et cetera. This is what we talk about when we're saying legacy protocols. Okay. Um, if you need help on how to figure out if you're using those, then reach out to us. There's a pretty simple way we can show you a uh, uh, authentication report in Azure that tells you how you what people are using those legacy protocols. All right, jumping into Azure AD, um, a pretty cool new feature that's available. It went general availability. The myapps.microsoft.com. If you have an Office 365 tenant, pop out to myapps.microsoft.com and you will see this little create button. Well, what you'll see is all the apps in your tent and it may look like a mess, okay? If it doesn't, then kudos, someone's doing something right. But I'll bet you most of yours looks like a mess. Um, but an end user um, can now go create their own little grouping. I called it essential apps in this screenshot. And then you can add applications that are in the environment into that little place that you contract your apps. Okay, users, end users can do that. You can also do this as an administrator. On the back end, you can create these things called collections, and um, you can put specific apps in it. You can target a specific group of people to see a specific grouping of apps. And so it makes interacting with the applications in Microsoft World a lot nicer. So pretty cool. Go check it out. Okay, access reviews to manage guest accounts. Um, there's a new option to disable and remove guest accounts as part of an access review. Uh, access review is an Azure AD Premium P2 feature. So if you want to use that, you've got to have a P2 license. And um, this is a really awesome feature. I love it. It's the best way I know of to curate and clean up guest accounts in your tenant. Okay. They, uh, the actual guest user gets an email. They can say whether they need to continue to have access to your environment as a guest user. If they don't, Microsoft will disable the guest account in your tenant and then remove it 30 days later. Okay, and so uh, pretty cool little feature there to help maintain and manage your guest accounts. Okay, um, another really fun new feature. Uh, it, this is one of the, the bigger security discussions that I like to have with my clients on enterprise apps. Um, in short, what we would tell people in the past is shut off the ability for end users to consent uh, and uh, onboard third-party apps into the environment, which then could read the information about that user. Whatever permissions that app asks for, the user probably didn't care and said, sure, go ahead. And then they could read their mailbox, they could delete their mail, they could read their calendar, their teams, all kinds of stuff could potentially happen. So a lot of times we would tell clients, just turn off the ability for users to consent. Um, that's pretty heavy handed. Microsoft now has exposed kind of a middle ground um, you can um, require the, uh, the user to type a reason why they want to use the app. An email gets sent to the administrator and they can review that application and then allow that consent. They can consent for the whole entire organization. So it's a one and done. And there's a lot better um, path for users trying to use third party apps to the administrator to review those and get those consented. Okay. So it's a great little piece uh, of, of updates there. Okay. Um, there's another place here where you can automatically allow users to consent to apps if they're from, quote, verified publishers, and the app is not requesting crazy lots of permissions, and you can define those permissions. So uh, this is a relatively new thing, and there's not a lot of apps that have gone through the work to become a, quote, verified publisher. You have to get on a list of Microsoft. Um, 
if you are creating an app and are interested in how to do that, let us know. We can help you through that. But uh, another feature of this is the um, is the uh, automatically uh, allowing consent for the end user when it's not a high risk app or it's been verified. Okay. All right. Uh, one of my new favorite features. I love it, except for a couple things that it's missing, and those are coming hopefully soon. But there's a new Azure ED Connect Cloud Sync Engine. It's now generally available. Um, some of the highlights: it supports multiple agents to for high availability. Today, if you're running mm -hmm. Azure ED Connect and you have one box that can be active at a time, period in the story, that box is down, you will not sync. Uh, you can install two, three, five of these little teeny lightweight agents on prem and get multiple. Uh, that any of them can sync up to the cloud. Uh, the management of this is all driven from the cloud side, so you don't have to get on the server, bring up the MIM console or the synchronization service console and manage stuff there. It's all handled on the cloud side now. Sync is every two minutes versus every 30 minutes. And the cool thing is if you're going through mergers and acquisitions and you've got a new company and they've got a separate domain in a forest and you want to connect their identities into your Microsoft tenant, the old way, you had to get network connectivity to connect your sync engine to their forest. Now you can just drop one of these little agents in their domain and it'll sync straight up to your cloud. So multiple different forests syncing up to a single cloud tenant with no on-prem connectivity between those forests is one of its really big selling points. Uh, I deployed that for a client two weeks ago. It's been working great. Okay. So new sync engine. Uh, whew, let me take a breath. All right. <laughs> Into an update. Um, I like get them all done up front. Into an update, just a couple things here. Um, administratively, this is a nice little feature here. Um, when you were in the Azure portal and you were looking at devices and you'd find the device associated with some user, um, you would click into it and it would be like, sorry, uh, this isn't where you manage devices. You need to go to the other admin tool. Well, Microsoft has now kind of bridged those gaps and you can easily jump over to the Endpoint Manager Admin Center from within the Azure Active Directory environment and click through, if you will, into the uh, Endpoint Manager. So nice little administrative feature that's easy to get you over to where you need to be there. Another nice feature here is when we're deploying applications through Intune, if for whatever reason something gets hung up on the desktop and the app doesn't successfully get installed, um, it gets frozen or fails, uh, the users can kick that app in the pants and get it to restart uh, if they reboot their machine or something. And uh, this is a new update to the company portal to make sure the apps do get fully deployed down to the device and they're more resilient to um, issues during install. Okay. I think that's most of what I had, if not all. Whew. Now I will shut up and we'll give you in the good capable hands of Mr. Kip and he'll take it away. Awesome. So Microsoft Teams, um, warning, there's a lot to go over here. So we're going to go over these briefly, as always, on a lot of these items reach out to us and we can provide more insights and kind of go into the technical details when necessary. So on the general features, the, the three things I chose, but we could we could probably spend an hour just going over Teams and SharePoint updates. So these are kind of the highlights that I think are important to you guys, um, but there's obviously more. So first on general features, approvals, task by planner, and pop out. So on the approval side, we have taken, or Microsoft has taken Power Automate, and if you went to Power Automate and you went to My Actions or My Approvals, they are now visible within the actual Teams client. So now when I get approvals, I can get a push notification within Teams, I can approve my workflows and actually have those occur within the Microsoft Teams client. Super great, kind of neat, interesting. Another interface, as we all know, Teams is pretty much a canvas for all things. And so this is Microsoft doing that same approach. However, there's a little bit more going on. And the idea of these ad hoc approval processes is a major different approach. So in this example on this screen in the top right, you see new approval requests. That's not a formal business approval process. That is just me asking for approval. So it, it's kind of been a different approach so much around business processes. We think like there's an approval for this exact thing, an approval for this exact thing. This is kind of ad hoc, right? Where someone could say, hey, can I purchase a new keyboard? And maybe your organization doesn't have a formal new equipment request process, but you can still request approval, select who that should go to. They could say, yeah, sure, they should approve it. And then it gets recorded. So it's almost like, a, a I don't know, a formalized email 
of an approval, but it's actually tracked as an approval. So I, I could see definitely smaller organizations utilizing this where we want to be agile in our approvals and not have to build formalized processes around every, everything, but I don't know, interesting nonetheless. This, the next thing around um, teams is pop-outs. This, is, this has been a huge ask um, for a while. So on individual chats and apps, I can actually take that chat and pop it out into a new independent window from the Teams Canvas and keep that open and then now navigate within a meeting and do other things. So we first saw this with meetings and then the general like Teams client. Now we're seeing it the general Teams client, meetings, and now these individual pop-outs. And that's available on individual chats as well as applications within the Teams client. And I'll talk about tasks within Planner here momentarily. So other things, meeting features around Teams that I think are, are worth mentioning. Uh, we have some pre-meeting options. If you haven't seen this within your tenant, uh, it's on its way, but this allows you to change your background, uh, use the blur features, change the devices that you're gonna use for your mic or your webcam before you actually join the meeting. Um, there's also features around the waiting room where we can now apply an image to the waiting room and have other content within the waiting room uh, for meetings that have not yet started. Meeting reactions, probably the most productive tool of Teams. We can now send a little floating heart in the middle of a meeting and not cause any form of distraction whatsoever. And at the same time, you know, make someone feel good about themselves. So it's really important. I'm just joking. That's a pause for everyone to laugh and realize that uh, this is a lame feature, I think. <laughs> yeah, little floating hearts. It'll, it'll, it'll make the world a better place with all the hate out there. All right, and then the last item is virtual breakout rooms. Um, I shouldn't say this, but Zoom did this really, really well. Uh, Teams and Microsoft is is coming. Um, personally, we've, we've seen a little bit of issues. There's, it, it's getting there, how's that? But it's not prime time. Um, but it's coming and it's a, it's a great idea. It's a great feature. It just needs a little bit more work. All right. Admin features around teams. Uh, there's more than this, but these are the key things I want to point out. There's new usage reports within the team's admin center. So administrators take a look at that. And then we've gotten a bump on the team membership. So an individual team within the team's client can now have up to 25,000 members within that team. And there's been major threshold changes on live events. I think it's up to maybe like 100,000 now. Um, in Teams meetings, I think it's up to 50,000. I mean, the, the numbers just keep increasing. So stay tuned to those. Um, Yammer updates. The proper update here is who cares? If you're using Yammer, don't touch. I'm just joking. So you Yammer guys, you're like a cult. I understand. Uh, you should be really excited that there's now a Yammer app in Teams. It's called Communities. So if you want to take a look at that, look, do a search for Communities, download the Yammer app, and it'll embed the Yammer interface within the Teams client. Um, and then if you feel like arguing, call me, and we'll talk about why you shouldn't be using Yammer versus Teams, because I love that debate. So I'm all about just rubbing people wrong. All right, Microsoft Viva. Super exciting. I'm going to try not to do what Microsoft does and like share all this amazingness and then like destroy your expectation that only like a little bit of it's available. So this is a precursor. I, I want to talk about what's on the roadmap, but we're going to deep dive in what exists today. So Microsoft Viva, I don't, I didn't even have a solid definition of what Viva is as a whole, but it's made up of four primary areas, insights, topics, learning, and connections. And insights are insights around your well-being and your effectiveness as an individual from a manager's perspective and as an org, and we'll go into those. Topics are Microsoft's play within the knowledge base area. Learnings is really pathways and videos and integrations. It's learning and development is really what it is. And it has a, a, some amazing integrations with our other tools. And then connections is your SharePoint internet being exposed within the team's client. That is literally all that is. So let's let's dive into each of these and I'll illustrate what's available today versus what's coming. So on the insight side, this is what's coming, right? And, and it's really integrations with Mindspace, Remote, 
you know, meditation. It, it, it takes my analytics for organizations using my analytics. It takes the my analytics engine and expose it within the team's client. So it's really around monitoring how much time you're spending on email, how often you're doing collaboration, and does your schedule give you any time for focus time to actually just get work done versus just busy work around communication. Now, what we have today is a very light version of this. So today, if you go to the team's client, you do a search for insights, you really have two things, stay connected and protect time. Stay connected, this is really kind of interesting. It reads in your emails, it says, hey, you emailed Dave Price and you said, I would get this into a proposal. Did you do that? So it's kind of like a little bit of a reminder based upon my emails. And then I also see here that Britt and Napoleon, I haven't met and had a one-on-one -on -one with them for a while. And it's suggesting available time on the right-hand side where I can hit that drop down, select and choose to send an invite. Really cool stuff until you realize that this doesn't make it a Teams meeting and it just books it on everyone's calendar. And then when you go to meet with them, you're all trying to figure out how, you, how are you gonna talk. <laughs> so th there's some things that need to be kind of flushed out. The, the other side is the protect time. And then as you can see here, the, the team's client is saying, hey, you have these available open slots on your calendar. Do you want to book these as focused time? And if I chose to uh, do that, then it would, you would see it here, it would change the status to remove a slot. It would update my exchange calendar with a meeting invite that says focus time that, with the status of do not disturb. So when my team's client understands when I'm in focus time, my status within Teams will now change to do not disturb, purple light, I won't receive notifications and et cetera. That is what Insights is today. Obviously a lot to come for Microsoft in regards to their overall larger plan and vision around Insights. All right, topics are knowledge-based tooling. Now, here's the, here's the point why I have this image up here because I think this is the strongest point. You'll see here, that in this chat message, there's the word SOAR. The user mouses over it and they get an intelligent uh, flyout card that gives a summary of what that is, who the potential people are, and then possible relative resources. That hyperlink or that flyout will now start showing up within SharePoint search, within Teams chat, and within emails and content within SharePoint pages. Super, super powerful. This is not yet available. Those intelligent flyouts are not yet showing up in Teams and in, 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 um, in, in uh, Exchange or your emails yet. What we do have today, though, is this. So as you can see here in this SharePoint site, I did a search for EOW. In the world of consulting, we call those an estimate of work, right? So I typed EOW. I hit the search key. And here's my search results. Estimate of work it has alternative names at EOW, statement of work, and SOW provides a description, people, and potential resources. This is a topic. This is topics working today in a 365 tenant. And you can see that it's that artificial intelligence is, is asking for some feedback. It's ask, actually asking me that uh, the knowledge network connection statement of work template to this topic, does that make sense? And I can hit yes, and it will take that in consideration in regards to that topic page. Now, if I clicked on the, on the title here and I go into the actual topic itself, I can read the details, I can see files that are pinned, and then I can see where this particular topic might be related to other topics. So in this example, it's related to a scope of work. And then I get that fly out and I can look into that content. So really powerful. You can make these topics manually or you can sit back and let Microsoft start generating topics, suggested topics, and then you can approve and publish them within your ecosystem. That is what topics is today. Obviously, still more work to come and more content coming. Learning, we'll make this really quick. These are just learning videos. The key thing is this is not available today. It's coming later this year. Integrations not only with Stream, but also with LinkedIn Learning, with Pluralsight and other tools to provide learning and development content to your employees. And then, like I mentioned earlier, connections, what does that look like? It's SharePoint, SharePoint and Teams. So Viva Connections is really the home site application that's coming to the, the, the Teams client. 
or organizations that want to promote Teams as the primary canvas to access all content. All right, so I gave you pretty much the announcement, right? We have soft releases around topics, topics and insights, learnings are coming later, connections, our public preview in the first half of, of this year. All right, let's talk about quick SharePoint updates. I'll make these really fast. Comments within lists, really powerful. We can use Power Automate to approve adding sites to a hub. File hover cards are now available within conversations and within libraries. We can do page comparisons within SharePoint. We can move, you can share a file and move it, and the sharing actually is tied now to the file, so those, those shares don't break. We have new web parts, such as the organizational web part, the calendar views with the SharePoint list. We can publish pages at a future date, and Microsoft has given us some additional header updates uh, within SharePoint as well. On the information governance side, make note that there's changes to the sensitivity labels and the hierarchy as well as the Compliance Center and Governance has some solution updates. Those are discussions in themselves. If you want an update around those, certainly reach out and let us know. We'll make this really quick. Forms, um, we can actually have a recipient that completes a form now download the results. That's within the settings of the form itself. And then keep in mind that forms, you can now generate polls within emails from your mail clients, from within Outlook, as well as from within Teams. So you can do these ad hoc polls within the ecosystem. And these are just examples of, of, of those two things happening, right? Here's an exchange email and me generating a poll, and then here's a form or a poll being generated from within the Teams client. And then last thing I mentioned earlier, but we'll just show you a quick screenshot, is we have smart backgrounds within Planner, we have intelligent file recommendations coming very soon within actual planner tasks and then tasks within teams. And uh, the only last thing I want to clarify here is it should really be to do and planner within teams. And so this is taking your individual Microsoft to do and all the plans that you're a member of and displaying them within the teams client and allowing you to manage those tasks from a central hub across the entire ecosystem. Very cool tool. This is available, it's general release, you can search and find it. So calls to action, the big thing is connect with us for more detail. We can help you guys understand some of these nuances. There's major moves happening from, from Microsoft's perspective around knowledge and content services, whether it's Syntax, Project Cortex, and Viva, and it's really driving the importance of knowledge management around intranets. And so if you guys are not or have not moved your internets to SharePoint or to the 365 reach out, we have internet packages that we can do. We have our journey team web parts, such as our staff directory and employee recognition that is part of those packages. And then as we all know, around governance and compliance, the provisioning process of 365 groups is such a major pain point. And we have been rolling out a group provisioning tool for a few clients. Reach out to us for more information. Need some water? Took it a deep breath. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We're gonna go over customer engagement. We'll transition a little bit to some some Power App stuff, and then we'll we'll wrap up uh, on some more customer engagement. In marketing, though, uh, in preview right now are a few additional things, uh, as well as plan for the April release, uh, release wave one of 2021. You are gonna get an additional. Uh, ability in the email editor to include more than just the contact for personalization settings. So now any data that you configure in marketing configuration, uh, you're able to pull that into an outgoing email and uh, personalize it. So this could be, again, you know, opportunity data. It could be any record that, that you want to link back. Uh, you're able to drop that information now in the assist edit. The other thing, uh, they're improving the email editor. It will be a point and click. So you click on the toolbox control, you click where you want it to go. Uh, you don't have to mess around with their drag and drop um, interface, which was a little clunky. Uh, a couple other things to, to note, uh, they've, they've improved the customer journey editor uh, where you build out your campaigns. Uh, so it's, it's also more of a, a click control of, uh, you know, click where you want to do something and then it's going to pop up a little fly out uh, to determine the actions that you want to do. 
The last thing I want to talk about on this page is uh, A-B testing. And uh, so there's a number of things that they're going to be doing uh, to improve this, uh, where they're going to have different, uh, like, you know, race conditions, how you pick the determining uh, message, if you want to continue with, you know, different variations of the same message. Uh, and then you can specify that to automatically convert or manage that manually of, um, you know, when you want your customer journey to use the winning, uh, the winning version. Okay. A couple other things. Uh, there will be more channels uh, that you can add into a customer journey. So today it uses activities, meaning you're going to have an email, phone call, or a task. But now you'll notice that there's a custom tile for custom channels. This could be uh, SMS. This could be a push notification to an Android or iOS device. Uh, this can also be WhatsApp. Uh, any number of channels that you're able to create a connector for, uh, we're able to now drop into the customer journey for sending out uh, communications to your, to your clients. And then the other thing that they continue to improve and build out on is the analytics. So as your customer journey is running, it is a real-time update of the information that's being collected back. So what are your bounces? Who's opening emails? Who's clicking links? Who's you know, going to the pages? Who's submitting the forms? Um, all there embedded, not only just in the customer journey, but it drills down into the emails analytics and then the contacts analytics. Okay, sales. Um, I picked just a handful of these. We've been playing around in the, in the sales for a long time, um, but in 2021, release wave one, that's going to get tiring to say, so I'm just going to say wave one from now on. Um, they're going to move personal settings uh, to make it so that it's easier to manage a lot of those things that you want to set up as an end user. Namely, you can design and, and manage your own email templates now and like your outgoing signatures for anything that's automated coming out of Dynamics. Um, they've also cleaned up and have updated those personalization settings. New KPIs, uh, so these are going to be automatically captured. It's going to show sellers what are their number of qualified leads, their number of calls they're making, number of meetings, and estimated values. These are embedded analytics, um, so charting and uh, graphing KPIs that are in the uh, pipeline. And then last, um, an advanced editable grid. This is where uh, they're cleaning up the current one. And if you've already turned it on for like the ad products that we'll show on the next slide, uh, it's very similar to that where you're going to have a, you know, different click controls. You're going to be able to input, you know, quantities, change price, all those kind of things. Um, but now in your view, have these abilities to, you know, show high, run aggregates and things like that. Okay. Um, from here, one more thing uh, on those grids, so when we're talking about both editable grids and then grids themselves, they're going to make it so that now you'll have quick access. So if you remember like quick creates, those fly out and they do a menu. Now it's going to be more of a hover and in the view itself, you'll be able to, uh, you know, fire off quick like activities, appointments, tasks, things like that. And then lastly, if you haven't turned it on, you can go in now. It is in um, an early preview. Um, you can switch over to the add products. So this is adding multiple products to your opportunities or quotes using a new control so that you don't have to add one, quick create, add one, quick create. Like now you can add in multiples and then there's a little filter function that lets you use either views you've made yourself or by using um, attributes of the products themselves like product family, product catalog uh, characteristics. Okay, Woo. switching gears, field service, ton of crap coming out. Um, but what they've really focused on, and, and we've been working with that product team, is they've really cleaned up the field service mobile application. So it's a much easier interface to use for managing their bookings, for uh, completing product installs. So if they're, if they're on site, um, they're trying to really drive everything to just be a quick, you know, one, two, three tap um, experience. Couple of other things um, around this. I want to talk about geofencing and then updates to the map. So both of these are somewhat related. So they've they've made it where the geocoding that takes place on addresses for service accounts is uh, going to go ahead and start putting that geofence perimeter around um, everything that has a location address. So your users, your resources, your service accounts. 
And then what Dynamics is able to do is once a tech on their mobile device enters a geofenced region, um, you can start to set that up now to, you know, not only update bookings, but, you know, some of the other things mentioned here, like inline maps, address recommendations. And then um, if they need to correct things, then they're able to, in their mobile device, um, auto geocode an address so that they can, again, get notifications when they're coming into an area um, and, and that type of stuff. But the main thing is really going to be updates back to the schedule board. So now in this map view, dispatchers will be able to see where the techs are, you know, are they en route? Um, have they entered into that geofenced region for uh, the service count? Uh, but that'll be close to real time. Without GPS, this is the next best thing. Okay. All right. New name time. This is the first one uh, in, in my group, but project service automation is now called project operations. Um, and if you don't have it installed today, you can actually get an early preview of it and you can go and, and install it um, into your, your tenant, into your environment. What is cool about this, and it's a little bit of a segue back to uh, what Kip was talking about with um, planner and project, but within Dynamics in project operations, you now have the ability to run um, a tr traditional like task grid. Um, you have a board, so think of a planner board. And then you also have a timeline view, which is using project for the web. So it saves the project as if it is a project for the web file, but it is showing it and managing it within project operations. So all of your tasks, resources, um, you know, dates, milestones, all of those are still built, managed within Dynamics, but you're using project for the web to create this. Huge improvement over the current version of PSA in terms of how you're able to quickly build out a timeline or a project, and then how you do resourcing. All right, um, real quick, Power App portals, and then I'll let Preston take other stuff on Power Apps. A um, couple things that are gonna be in April, so I just wanted to focus on these, and, and then a pretty cool preview portal because we were talking about field service earlier. You are now able to use in the Power Apps Portal API an unbound uh, Dataverse action, which means that you don't have to be tied to the entities that you're using in Dynamics or in Power Apps um, to, to, to trigger an action. So now you can, you can basically start calling um, anything through the, uh, the, the Power App Portal Web API. Very cool stuff right there. Uh, we, we were limited beforehand. Um, and then as mentioned, there is a portal already pre-built for uh, field service. And this is going to let customers know, like, hey, I'd like to sign up for updates or, you know, where's my tech at? So when we were talking about geofencing earlier, they'll be able to see where the tech last entered a region, right? You know, are they still at home? Are they at the office? Are they en route? Or, you know, have they pulled into your neighborhood and they're within the radius? So very cool stuff um, to be managed on the Power Apps portals. Power App portals, just FYI, if you're using other things in Dynamics, it is the portal for that. It's the portal for marketing sites. It's the part, portal for marketing event sites as well. Okay, other Power App stuff, Preston. Yeah, very similar to uh, some updates in SharePoint, uh, Power App's got a pretty big lift on their search capabilities. So if you search for BLUW instead of BLUE, it will return those results, or if you search for a Datum Corp instead of a Datum Corporation, it will uh, bring back those those bits of information that you're there, that you're actually looking for. Um, overall, a better understanding within search as well. So Bob Lyon would return results for Robert Lyon as well as Rob. Fast eight spelled out would return things for the fast number eight. I mean, you can kind of get the idea, but this is kind of cool too. If you were to search for open a Datum opportunities. It would go to opportunity table and find um, a datum as a customer, which are open as well. Um, if you have like accounts in the LA table, that was your search criteria. It would pull back accounts in Los Angeles. So overall, search is just getting quite a bit smarter. Um, that search capability also moves to the model-driven apps on mobile. So it's now in the header. It allows you to see your recent search history. Um, as well as IntelliType. So as you're typing, it will show you results. Um, it's actually pretty quick as well. Um, and finally, for the mobile app, 
we've got a new public preview for the overall look of the app. So um, you can turn this experience on in your settings, or it will just pop up and ask you, hey, do you want to try the new experience? And you can choose yes or no. But this will allow you to pin. Uh, basically, you have a personalized homepage of the apps you use most frequently. You can pin different apps to your uh, home screen and or um, star them or favorite them inside the app. And then you can see all of your apps across environments, which is super handy. Um, lastly, on the Power Apps front as a whole, this one's kind of fun. You can now, it's fun and terrifying at the same time. Um, you can bring a table into Dataverse for Teams and edit that table inside of Excel. So if you need to do a bulk, bulk upload of information, you can just dump it into your Excel file and hit publish. Um, it does take some of the data integrity constraints that exist in your uh, Dataverse tables. For example, like these are the only values that are allowed in this column, um, in a choice column, and then it, those will persist into your Excel file. So that's pretty cool. Um, if you haven't heard already, we are offering a new Power Apps Sherpa, Sherpa program. So we have this for Business Central as well as Power Apps. And the Sherpa program, if you imagine somebody climbing to the top of Mount Everest, you've got the Sherpa team who's helping you get to the top. Um, the Sherpa Power Apps program from Journey Team is a five week program where we have scheduled workshops, scheduled office hours. And you can interact with other people in the class as well as one-on-one -on -one sessions that will take you from, from the idea of an app to the implementation of an app for your um, organization. So $9,500 for implementing an app for your, for your team. It's a pretty cool opportunity as well as uh, to get trained on Power Apps as well as to get some one-on-one -on -one help from experts on how to build that app in, a, a, uh, in the most appropriate way. So that's the Power App Trip Program. Back to you, Eric. Oh, hey, thanks. You're welcome. That was a great handoff. Thanks. I've got one for you at the end of this. Oh, yes. <laughs> All right, customer service. A um, lot of fun things, but one thing I do want to plug here is that uh, many times when we go into like a call center or really any business, we will do a maturity model assessment. And it's really to find out how the organization is working and operating as a whole together. Um, and so there are different levels of maturities for processes. And what we come in and, and map out is essentially for every functional area, think of it like a team or a department, we rate where are you at in, a, in terms of maturity? Are, are you, you know, standardized? Are you working together? Does everybody in the company know what your process is? Does everybody in your team know what it is? Like all of those things factor in. And then we use four different uh, steps to go through to determine, you know, how well everyone is, is communicating and working together. So I do want to bring that up. That is something that we offer. It's extremely insightful to understand like how certain pockets of, of teams are more efficient than others. Um, and then why sometimes an organization can't grow is because one area still needs improvement and development before another more performing team can even uh, go further. So do you want to call that out? We do that a lot in our um, call center as well as just most um, most engagements. Okay, case management. A couple things I want to call out here that are coming out. You can now update resolved and canceled cases. This has been a huge issue. It used to be just read only and you were locked out. But if there was additional follow up or you know post resolution that needed to be done, uh, you always had to work around it or use God mode, and you were worried who you gave access to that tool to. Now you can update those uh, directly. The next thing is they're going to be rolling out more embedded analytics for customer service managers. If you haven't downloaded the pack or the app already for Power BI, do that. And they're uh, releasing more information on that. Okay. I'm going to talk about Omnichannel for the next couple slides. And I'm not going to read all of these, but essentially Omnichannel um, within Dynamics has built out their commute or their channel integration framework so that you can essentially go in and configure and set up um, the connection to your telephony platform. And now within Omnichannel, there is the ability to use the communication services uh, within them to start to handle additional call recording, uh, call routing, and things like that. So Microsoft's starting to step into that CPaaS game um, with this, but it'll still work with an existing telephony provider as well. 
Other things to note that the voice bot with Power Virtual Agents, uh, that you can use that to then direct and route into a voice channel uh, within Omni Channel. So very cool stuff there. Um, and again, you know, Azure Communication Services is going to be the, uh, the communication platform as a service that's running uh, Omni Channel Voice. Okay, Omni Channel Chat. Um, you can hook this up so that you're going to be using, you know, Microsoft's chat. Uh, you can use other digital messaging. It's just a, a SKU that you add to it. Um, we've prototyped WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger. You can use, um, you know, really any embedded chat. We've done SMS, uh, but all of those come into the Omni channel uh, for customer service, and they all look more or less like this, where you've got the left-hand pane. You're able to manage your sessions across the top, and and then you know bounce between. Well, I'm chatting this person, I'm texting this person, and I'm, you know, WhatsApping this person or snapping this person. Whatever channel you want to integrate, again, it's part of the CIF or the Channel Integration Framework, and extremely cool to have um, all embedded within Dynamics. Yeah, and because we were talking about chat, let's do the next one. All we'll right. Talk about Power Virtual Agent. So circa middle of 2019, Microsoft rolled out Power Virtual Agents as the newest feature member of the Power Platform. Um, when they did that, the world changed. <laughs> uh, what's really cool about the Power Platform or about Power Virtual Agents? They are they allow you the ability to create and manage super powerful chatbots without the need for code or AI expertise. Um, you can largely have with this gra graphical interface create the conversation thread that your uh, customer may have with the virtual agent um, and, and take the load off of your internal humans to do things that they don't necessarily need to do or that are super repetitive or understandably um, pass alongable. That's a terrible word, but uh, that you can pass along to a, uh, a robot or chatbot to do. Um, built into Power Virtual Agents is the ability to take action on things using Power Automate. So if you can do anything in Power Automate or Logic Apps, you can put it into Power Virtual Agents to execute those steps as part of your conversation. Um, the reason that uh, it's so timely that Eric handed this to me to talk about Power Virtual Agents is that if your client starts having the conversation with the virtual agent online and the client's like, hey, I just need to talk to a human, or the, the bot realizes, I don't have the answers to your question, it the, it most elegantly hands it off hands it off to the Omni Channel Hub for communication back with another human. So that's pretty sweet. Um, two quick features here to talk about. I guess three. Uh, Power Virtual Agent comes to Teams, so you can now build a chatbot right inside of Teams. There's a Power Virtual Agent app. Turns like sounds out like there's an app for that. This is the new uh, mantra for Teams. But um, Power Virtual Agents made their their way to Teams. And so you can have conversations with the, the chatbot and or build a chatbot right there inside of Teams. Um, the next one, Power Virtual Agent Composer, or sorry, the Bot Framework Composer is now integrated with Power Virtual Agents. So if you have somebody who's on the techie side and is good at coding up a Bot Framework conversation um, in the Bot Framework Composer, you can now use that as part of your um, experience with Power Virtual Agents. Uh, next and the last for Power Virtual Agents is that the, um, it's now included in the Center of Excellence Starter Kit, so you can see who's using it, what kind of conversations are occurring, and get a better view of what's happening around the PBA uh, in your tenant. So that is Power Virtual Agents. Next up is Power Automate. If you haven't used Power Automate, you should do it for all sorts of things. Um, there are menial tasks and repetitive tasks that all of us do each and every day. For example, I just created a super cool, I'm loving this flow, by the way, that I just created. Uh, when I get a receipt in my email, I can forward it to my plus addressing email, and then it turns my email into a PDF, stores it in a file folder that at the end of the month, it then sends to Cami, who takes care of all of my uh, receipts at the end of the month, or my uh, expense reports. So, I, like Power Automate has a very special place in my heart for taking the crap that I don't like to do and doing it for me. Um, this month, or over the last couple of months since our last uh, meeting with everyone, we've released, or not we've, but Microsoft has released a whole bunch of new connectors. Um, 
My favorite one, though, by far, is the new Power, uh, Power BI Data Flows connector. Why this? Why is this cool? Um, historically, in the Power BI world, when you wanted to refresh a data set you and a, a data flow, you kind of had to time things. So let's say at 8 o'clock, my data flow refreshes. At 8.30, my data set refreshes. And maybe by 8.45, uh, the whole process is done and my data is ready to go. With this new Power BI Data Flows connector, I can say when it's done, refresh my data set. So my, generally speaking for clients, it goes from about 45 minutes, maybe average, to half of that, 22, 20 minutes for a full refresh to occur across all of those different areas. So that is pretty sweet. Um, I think that's it for Power, Power Automate. Uh, let's hand it over to Scott for Business Central. Yeah, so uh, George and I are going to go over the Business Central updates. Um, there's been a whole ton of different uh, Business Central updates that have happened, a lot of cool stuff happening. Uh, since there's so many and not enough time to share them all, we're going to kind of concentrate on the Dataverse integration. So, um, so in uh, Business Central, uh, there is Dataverse now, which uh, used to be called the CDS. Uh, what's, what's really cool about this is that it, Kind of links together your customer engagement with Business Central. That's because together kind of gives you a full experience to kind of run your business. Um, and uh, so with what's available currently is pretty much most of the normal entities you see within CRM for customer engagement as well as within Business Central. So you can go on ahead and uh, map your contacts to your contacts, go on ahead and add any mapping that you want to add. So just in case, uh, like for example, if your units of measure don't match up to your units of measure, you can go on ahead and create that custom mapping between the two. And uh, the nice part about it now is with a, a small extension and a teeny bit of code, you can uh, go on ahead and expose all the other uh, custom fields within CRM, Sweet. as well as within Business Central, which I think is a pretty cool thing. Uh, so just in case any customers customize customer engagement, which I know everybody does, you can actually utilize those fields. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah, so okay. uh, hi, Scott. Sorry, I thought they were going to toss it to me. They tossed it straight to you. Um, uh, w one thing about the context of this, uh, with with the ERP system, you know, ERP systems kind of evolve slowly. We're, we're really focused on always staying standards compliant and it's very business process oriented. It's not quite as tech oriented as a lot of the other uh, products that we have in our stack here. But one of the areas that really is a, a big issue is integrating with the rest of the stack. And Microsoft early on, um, when they announced the, the Dataverse, although it was originally called CDS, and you've probably heard that recurring theme that uh, of Microsoft changing uh, the product names on us. Um, it's been pretty nice to see them as they are gradually getting Business Central integrated into that Dataverse stack. And now we're actually getting connectivity between Business Central and the other products within the stack uh, through that Dataverse. Even some of the items that, um, that uh, Preston has been talking about with uh, Power BI, Power Apps, Power Automate, um, all of that ties into Business Central, um, it can tie in through the data, the Dataverse. And so this is giving us the ability to really get Business Central integrated, not just more tightly with other items in the Microsoft stack, but also uh, through Power Automate and various other Azure services available in the stack to connect it to external systems. Um, maybe Scott, you can talk a little bit about um, this particular example that you gave here. Um, what was the challenge the customer was facing and, and how did this technology enable you to, to solve it and yet stay within kind of the, uh, starting with the out of the box features of the, of the integration? Yeah, sure. So the challenge that they were running into was in the customer engagement. Uh, they wanted to see salespeople to kind of control when an order was coming over to Business Central. So there's a custom field in uh, customer engagement that they utilize for that. And that currently wasn't available in common data, well, Dataverse um, integration inside uh, BC. So what we did is we just went out ahead and created a quick table extension, and page extension. So it'd be available in BC and it could filter it out. So it'll only bring over the orders with where the salesperson has agreed that they should come over to Business Central to be fulfilled and shipped out to the customer. 
Yeah, so you were able to take the out of the box um, rather than having to write a complete integration from scratch because it didn't mm -hmm. the out of the box one didn't work for them. You were able to just extend the out of the box experience. Um, I think we're finding it common too that um, people really love dimensional accounting within Business Central. It allows them to create um, various views of their financial statements based on um, dimensional or analysis data passed from the transactions into the uh, ledger transactions, but different companies get their dimension values from different data points within CRM, and so it's impossible to create a canned integration that'll work for everybody to bring those dimension values over, and so we're finding this is a great way, isn't it, to take a specific field in CRM, like say the, the market channel that's already a base field on the account, and saying, well, we actually have a market channel analysis field or dimension in BC, so let's map that to populate the dimension on the GL transactions when we bring them over into Business Central. So I think that's another great application for this technology. So, no doubt. Um, yeah. So with uh, so we're, about, we're about out of time. We're gonna let Preston kind of just really briefly cover the, the his, his section on Power BI, and then we'll let everybody go. And if you have meetings at 11, this is worth staying for, of course, because we left the best for last, right? Um, not that anything else wasn't as good. Uh, okay, Power BI for the fifth year in a row, sixth year in a row now. Uh, starting back in 2016 when they became eligible for this magic quadrant, they were already at the top as part as part of the leaders in the section of Gartner's magic quadrant, and over the last six years have continued to spread the gap between themselves and the competitors. Last year, we had a pretty close gap or a pretty close competitor with Tableau, but as of 2021, that gap grew quite a lot and Microsoft is killing it. Like Power BI really is the next level uh, analytics tool that everyone should be using when it comes down to it. Um, we're gonna go quick, but I don't wanna cover, the, I don't wanna just slash things that are important. So the latest update for Power BI came out on Tuesday of this week. There were 33 major improvements and hundreds of little things. So if you haven't already updated, you should. Next, in Power BI data flows, we got these sweet features earlier in January, our sweet little icons that tell you what's happening in your query. Historically, we didn't know what was being folded, we didn't know um, what wasn't being folded, and now we can figure it out to a large degree. Uh, so this is pretty cool. Next one, Datasets Hub. So if you install the Power BI app, inside of Teams. Once again, there's the Teams app for that. Um, you can actually see all of your data sets that you have access to in a single place. Right now, this is only available in Teams. It's kind of weird that it's the only place you can get to it, but it is pretty cool that you have a single place across workspaces where you can see all of your data sets now. Next, we released in November, we being Microsoft, um, anomaly detection into a, quite a few different graphs. That is a, like broken out by um, some explained parameters here on the right. Once you try to click into it and see what's going on. Just in December, they released uh, anomaly detection for Power BI Mobile. So if you see some anomalies inside your graph, you can click on that and it will try to explain what's going on or what the data suggests um, are the, the changes there. Uh, we'll see if we can skip this one. We've got Masterclass that's currently running. From, um, we started three weeks ago, we've got another 17 weeks or I guess 14 weeks to go. We have classes from DAX or covering DAX, visualizations, power, like performance optimization, administration, power, auto, power automate, power apps, and virtual agents. So if you have any questions on how to run or use parts of Power BI specifically, uh, this is a great class to go to. Each of these classes is a full day and if you use this code at the bottom, JT Dash Tech Insider Update, you can you get 35% off, and um, which is pretty sweet. So I think that's it for Power BI. We blew through it, but uh, in record time. All right. Well, thank you everybody for attending.